You're listening to the AfterBuzz TV Network. Now the largest new media platform on the web and your number one source for after-show entertainment. Very good, Keith. Johnson. Yep. Oh, and On the AfterBuzz studios in Los Angeles, California, and streaming live on Ustream, this is AfterBuzz TV for Courtney and Kim Take New York. We'll break down tonight's episode and get you all the latest Courtney and Kim news and gossip. If you'd like to buzz in on tonight's show, you can buzz us at 424-256-1729. That's 424-256-1729. And now, picking up where the show leaves off, and the buzz continues, it's After Buzz TV for Courtney and Kim Take New York. Well, hello, everybody, and Happy New Year, and welcome to the first After Buzz TV after show for myself and my co-host, Mari Fagel of 2012. What better way to start off than with... Courtney and Kim take New York. We're in episode five already, which is amazing. Uh, I am fresh off the slopes of Aspen. I know Mari, my jet-setting co-host, is fresh off the beach of Cabo, but here we are again, back together on AfterBuzz TV. Welcome, Mari. Hello. Yes, well, I was kind of sad to be coming back home from Cabo to chilly, chilly New York. At least I had uh, an extra dose of the Kardashians to watch today, and it was as entertaining as always. Uh, but I have to make a quick note, just because this was like, I have this annoying neighbor, and I hope she hears me right now, because the walls are obviously very thin. <laughs> I have this annoying neighbor <laughs> who plays the piano literally every single day, every single day, and... Like, there's nothing I can really do about it. And I was watching this episode of Scott playing the piano, and here he is playing the piano at the same time as my annoying neighbor playing the piano, and I was going crazy. <laughs> well, that is so funny because my first thought, and of course, Billy Scott and his storylines, you know, I was like, leave it to Scott to buy, of all things, a piano and put it in the middle of New York City. Uh, but that is, of course, just Scott and the way he is. And as silly as the storyline kind of seemed to me, I mean, it got even worse with Courtney and her coupons. Of course, we'll get to that. But Scott always has a way of making things funny for me. I mean, you really can't get lighter on storylines than a piano and coupon clipping, as Chris put it, when you're a millionaire. Um, but as we always say, Mari, I kind of appreciate when the real character of these, of these people come out, and that's what makes any storyline and any show, any episode interesting. And you have to just laugh when Scott is walking in his three-piece suit and, you know, passing a piano store and I don't even mind the shameless plug of Steinway and Sons because he's just hysterical, you know, the way he approaches these situations. So, and there you are, Mari, relating to it with your neighbor, with the piano. Um, so what did you think of this storyline? Because for me, it's kind of, you know, he's, I feel like they're dabbling in these kind of ridiculous storylines for Scor Courtney and Scott, yet I buy it because they make me laugh and I, and I enjoy that. What do you think? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I know there are these contrived storylines, but Scott is so hilarious that it doesn't bother me. I think the couponing thing was a little, like, trite and boring. But the piano thing was funny because Scott and his one-liners, like, he walks into the piano store and he's like, what's that smell? That's the smell of wealth. And then, like, walks down to play the <laughs> piano in this, like, Hugh Hefner-esque velvet laser and then talks about how he is going to throw all the other rappers out of the game once he starts spin spitting rhymes. He, everything that comes out of his mouth is hilarious, so I don't really care what contrived situation they put him in. He's always going to make me laugh. Right. I totally agree. And I have to say, even Courtney playing off of him was funny. I mean, just the, like, the way that she's like, you know, if you win, I'll do you on the piano. Only if you do me dirty. And if he doesn't, it goes back. You know, like she, she played into it, you know, and made me laugh as well. 
and the rapper line, I'm so glad you brought that up because that was hysterical for me. Um, but here's kind of the one thing that I sort of felt like I entered twilight, the twilight zone was him playing the piano and are, are Kim and Chris really sitting there like Chris in leopard, like clapping for him, like as if he's not like, I felt like this should be Mason playing twinkle, twinkle, little star, because they were like these grown adults playing three notes on the piano, everyone applauding him. I mean, it, it's so silly, but if anyone can pull it off, it's Scott. That's just kind of my bottom line with it. And, of course, Courtney in her star pajamas. And then even just her line telling him he looks like a creep. You know, these these little one-liners kind of get me through these kind of non-realistic storylines, which it's supposed to be reality television, but <laughs> so it goes. And but, it's so you know. funny because all the situations are, you know, overproduced, contrived, whatever. But Courtney and Scott have so much more fun with it than Kim and Chris and seeing when the four of them are together and you see Courtney and Scott having all this fun together and just how light and funny and witty and bantering back and forth. And then you see Kim and Chris that it's kind of just like they're lame, they're tense. You really see the difference. Absolutely. I always say this, that you cannot hide behind anything when you're on television, when you're in the spotlight. You cannot hide anything, which brings me to, I can't wait to talk about Jonathan, but, you know, that being said, you bring up a great point. You can't hide things. So Courtney and Scott, they know they're doing these kind of contrived storylines. They have a good relationship now, so they don't really have much to go off of. They have to kind of do these silly things, I think, which normal couples kind of do do these silly things. You know, the husband comes home with the car or a new car. Or, you know, there's always like some grand purchase that somebody can relate to, I'm sure, which is why they do these storylines. But they, their real characters come out. Their real relationship with each other comes out. And you can tell it's a good one. And, you know, that makes them likable. And that's why I always enjoy as silly as they are, these storylines with Courtney and Scott, thank gosh for them, because they lighten up what otherwise would just be kind of, as you said, boring, uh, you know, definitely unhappy sort of television with the with the other couple here is Kim and Chris. And, you know, and thank so God for uh Thank God for Chloe's Skype session because she just even even like the one minute she was on Skype, she makes things hilarious. You know what I mean? And you just see how fun Courtney and Chloe are together. And that's why it's so much fun watching Chloe and Courtney take Miami. And when you see that compared to Kim and Courtney, it's it's two, two different shows. You're watching two different shows. One is a comedy and one is a drama. So it depends on what you like more. But when Kim is involved, it's not going to be light. It's not going to be comedic. It's going to be drama. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting you said that about Chloe, and that is a great point, and I feel like our Twitter fans agree. Uh, Southern Siren said, the biggest thing I want is Chloe back on my screen. She's the best. So we hear you, Southern Siren. We agree with you on that. And, um, you know, I think that that's totally – whether – it's made to be that way and produced to be that way or not, Kim is always in the center of drama. But before we get to that big drama of the episode, and Jonathan's making uh, you know, his way into the drama quite a bit on this season, uh, let's just go touch upon Courtney and her coupons because bring, you know, you bring up Chloe. Um, this is the storyline that I think was a little too far-fetched for me. I mean, she's... I have to kind of agree with Chris Humphreys, and I think I'm going to say that a lot tonight, which people may or may not want to hear from me, but he may not say things in the best way, but she is a millionaire. Is she really taking the couponing thing seriously? Come on, I don't think so. I think it's kind of insulting to people who actually do need to clip coupons, and she doesn't even know where to begin. Like she's her saying, where do I go to clip coupons? To me, comes off as a little unlikable. And as much as I love Courtney and Scott, this storyline, I much preferred the piano storyline over the couponing thing because, you know, her bringing Brooke, this poor girl, into the 
Gansevoort Hotel to talk about couponing, you know it's, it, I just don't buy it. And I'm kind of glad that Chris called that to light. I have to agree with him on that. Yeah, I still thought it was fun and light. Not as funny as the piano thing. Um, But have you ever seen that show, Extreme Couponing? Because it is pretty crazy. And so, I don't know, Corby's was like paled in comparison and it didn't really make sense because she was buying toilet paper when she stayed in a hotel and wasting a ton of money. And yes, it was contrived, but um, I don't know, that whole like fascination with couponing is it's kind of interesting and I do like I mean I think actually here's where I'll say Kim uh, I'm on her side she brought up a funny point is that the fact that she's buying things she doesn't even need just so she can save seven dollars so basically at the end of the day she's wasting her money and I thought it was kind of funny how Courtney did kind of get into it and say she felt like she was in Las Vegas I mean it it did stay light, but I'm just um I'm more for the piano thing. I thought Scott pulled that off. He he kind of pulls off these lighter storylines a little bit better than this came off to me. Um, you know, obviously she's not going to sit there and clip coupons past this episode. But you know, I guess people can relate to it. I have to watch that show now because maybe I'll I'll kind of get get in on the coupon thing. But um, you know, it was just a little silly. I, you know, I, the piano thing was silly too, but that at least made me laugh a little bit more. Um, but I really do think that Chris sometimes, you know, Kim says he, he says whatever's on his mind and that can be a bad thing. I don't know if it's necessarily such a bad thing as we start to get into the Kim, Chris, Jonathan thing, because you're on national television. So you're opening yourself up to basically anything. So if you're agreeing to be on national television for reality, it's your life on television. So I don't know if it necessarily bothers me so much that Chris kind of says whatever's on his mind about people, because I think that whoever's on this show with him, be it Jonathan, be it Courtney with her coupons, I think they have to be open to taking reality, a dose of reality from Chris. So I think we should kind of get into this because here comes the drama. Where do you stand (laughs) on Chris and Kim and Jonathan and this whole triangle gay debacle? Okay, well, I always assumed Jonathan was gay, and I assumed the world knew about it and it wasn't an issue and whatever until, you know, the preview for this season came up and then, you know, the whole Jonathan may be threatening to sue Chris for defamation. I thought, oh, well, he must not be out of the closet then. Part of me thinks, how could Kim never question this? If they're that close, how does she not assume he's gay? How does she just, like, go on about her her best friendship with him and, like, not assume anything or not know about his the status of his love life? However... It's none of Chris's business. And it, and he asked it once. Fine. I don't know. I don't even know if I agree with him asking it, but whatever. He asked it once. He said no. Leave it. Drop it. Who cares? Whatever. The thing is, though, I think this was a pretty overproduced segment because Jonathan Cheban is probably the worst actor I have ever seen. So you got to stick to reality TV, Jonathan, because you cannot act. Because... When Chris first asked him and he said, are you gay? It was like his supposedly look of shock and surprise on his face. He was like kind of smiling and laughing. I don't know if you picked up on this, but all three of them, like like him and Jonathan, in the whole, all the segments about this, like, are you gay or not? They were like smiling and laughing while they were like, oh, it was, I can't believe he said that. And they just, it seemed way too overproduced. But... You know, so that's where I stand on it. I still think Chris took it too far, though. And I actually commend Jonathan for when he was, like, sitting at the table, like, get, like throwing all these clips at Chris, like, well, you're unemployed and this and that. You know, and Kim was like, you've gone too far. But Chris is a dick, and he, it's like he, he can he can dish it, but he can't take it. So I thought it was good that Jonathan finally stood up for himself and said something. Um, I do think it was overproduced. But, yes, Chris took it too far. See, 
I want to say that I would agree with you that he took it too far, but here's my issue with it. This is a produced storyline. So how can he take it too far when Jonathan should know that anything is game? So as you said, if he was just acting, I hope he was acting because how can you be on a reality show, know the produced storyline is going to happen because you do. This is a produced show. Even though we all want to think this naturally happens, they set up trailers. They go to the good home. They get a plug. They smell potpourri. It's planned. So we know that this is planned. But so for me, Jonathan acting surprised, I hope he is acting because how can you be so surprised? You know this is going to happen. You're opening yourself up to this. Jonathan is really making his way onto the show this season. And I don't know if I buy his drama, um, but I can't blame Chris for throwing these things out there. It's reality television, you know? It's not like he's sitting in a very proper, uh, you know, uh, not unfilmed party of people and saying, dude, are you gay? That's what reality television is all about, to bring up these kinds of things, and you're opening yourself up to it. I mean, look at the real world. Look at all these shows. This is always a storyline. So I don't really want to blame Chris here because I sat back and thought the same exact thing. I mean, if you think about it, Mari, you kind of have to laugh. He's standing in the good home smelling potpourri, and he gets taken aback when Chris asks him if he's gay. I mean, that's laughable in itself. So that's one reason I don't really mind Chris here. And the other reason I don't mind is because he's very real, even through the quips and through the, you know, the fighting. He's like, call me gay every day. I don't care. You're on reality TV. You can't care. You're on, it's not like Simon being outed by a um, Jackie, I'm pretty sure he cares now, now that he's being booed every single basketball game, and he has been voted the most hated basketball player. I'm sure he cares now about what how he portrayed himself and the fact that he even signed up for reality tv yeah well that that is for sure we're gonna have to get into news and gossip uh to talk about that one but yeah i i don't know where chris stands on all this now i certainly think he's really regretting a couple of decisions in his life but i can't really hate on him here uh, apparently a whole stadium of people w- were hating on him recently, but if you look at this episode, I just, I, I don't know. I don't think he was, t- I mean, his approach, I will side with Kim that his approach is not the best, but on reality television, do I really care about his approach? I don't really think so because you know what, at the end of the day, is he really doing anything wrong to Kim so far? If you really look at this so far, Is he really doing anything wrong to her? Is he acting like a really bad person to her? Because even at the end of this, he apologizes. He comes around. He says, I'm sorry. Maybe I can learn something. Listen, he's a guy. Guys do, look at Scott's doing stupid things too, but just in a different light. So I don't know. He apologizes at the end. And, you know, the only reason he apologized, the only reason he apologized at the end is to like wrap up this produced segment in a nice little tiny bow. It's like Modern Family. I absolutely love Modern Family, and I think it's hysterical, but at the end of every episode, they always have this, like, and the moral of the story is this. So da-da-da-da-da, and, like, they wrap it up in a nice little tiny bow. And so that's what I felt this, like, like Simon telling his, like, sob story about, about how someone outed him to his mom, and Chris is like, well, you know, now I can relate because I wouldn't want to do that to Jonathan. Like, I don't know. I just thought it was very produced. So I do think that, you know, Simon coming out and telling his story, whenever someone like that shares their story, it promotes awareness and it promotes the cause. And you see, when you see more gay people on your television, people who are not used to that culture become more used to it. And so I commend the Kardashians for addressing a subject like this and for Simon to talk about how difficult it was to deal with, you know, his teacher outing him to his mom and everything. I I still think that Chris's apology was just like a produced way of like neatly tying up the storyline. Well, speaking of produced though, but this is again, a storyline that he probably didn't even introduce himself. And he, 
kind of had to probably say that without even planning that himself. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm giving Chris credit here, but speaking of produced, how, how, how fake, no matter what Jonathan's preference is, and I actually don't care what his preference is, and I do agree that any awareness is a good thing, so I actually wish that, that Jonathan was more open in the end, at the end of the day, because he still wasn't. He said, I want to leave it at that. If he wants to promote it like Simon, whether he is or isn't, I kind of wish he would have handled it, handled it differently. And I really think, what was he doing with this fake date thing? Because I have to agree with Chris again. I feel like the joke's on them because that is the fakest date I've ever seen in my life. And who invites somebody to come meet a date before they go out on a date? I mean, come on. You couldn't have agreed with that one. No, I that that was not a real date. So why why does Chris care so much? It kind of felt like a like a witch hunt. Like why does he care so much? I do agree. He definitely pushed it very far, but was that even him pushing it very far? I'm not sure. No. I do have to laugh though at Kim. <laughs> Leave it to Kim to come up with the <laughs> the way that she tried to find out is her saying, did you catch this? The, she's like, well, I changed in front of him to see if he would look. <laughs> like, Kim, yeah. I'm really pretty sure that that's not going to solve the, the issue. So hopefully <laughs> she's not going to become a detective anytime soon. But that kind of made me laugh. Um, you know, Southern Siren, again, tweeting with me today, tweeting with us on, on After Buzz TV, before we started After Buzz TV, called out another good point when it comes to Kim. Kim being pissed about Chris treating Jonathan badly, yet she called her sis a jealous, ugly troll is beyond hypocritical. It's been three weeks, and Kim has yet to apologize. At least Chris was shown apologizing in the same episode he was an ass in. So I'm glad someone out there is kind of thinking on my wavelength. I do agree. I feel like Kim, you know, Chris may not say things in the nicest way, but let's bring up bring up another point. Was Kim really that nice to Chris at points in this episode? I don't know if you noticed this, Mari, but at one point she was saying, you know, he was trying to play the piano and I think he did a pretty good job. And she was like, stop playing that. It's so annoying. I've heard enough. That wasn't really very nice. And then she also said at one point, um, I think she said, you're like the most annoying person in the world when they were going down to spy on Courtney and then Jonathan saying about the the wedding registry, saying they're never going to use their stuff. Uh, to me, these were some telling lines, and that doesn't come off very well with me as far as Kim's concerned. Did you catch any of that? Yeah, but Kim's always like that. I don't know. She's always a little bit selfish, a little bit of a drama queen, spoiled brat, crybaby, all of the above. <laughs> so I've never really liked like that concerned with it. I don't know. She always, she always makes for dramatic television. And I'm just like now looking forward to seeing the actual divorce filing come down because each week, all of these episodes and all these fights, yes, they're fighting in pretty much every episode, but they seem like little fights. And it is like when you're newly married, it's difficult to navigate so far, thus far in the five episodes we've seen, nothing to me has been that big of a red flag that like, wow, okay, now I understand why this marriage wouldn't work. I mean, even the whole them trying to figure out where they're living, that to me seemed like the biggest issue, but not something that couldn't be overcome. And so I'm just waiting for when these like final blows come to a head because everything I've seen thus far doesn't seem like like marriage shattering. I totally agree with you on that. I was actually, that was going to be my next question is we're in the fifth episode. It looks like next week is going to be two episodes back to back and the preview, you know, we're going to get to that in predictions, but it kind of makes you think here's where it's all going to go down. But up until this point, and I want to know if you guys out there on Twitter agree with us, definitely tweet us at Jackie Moran, uh, Mari Fagel, and Legal Lady Tweets, and After Buzz TV. Um, we want to know your opinion. Up until this point, I agree with you, Mari. I'm not seeing 
what would cause such a earth-shattering end to a 72-day marriage. I'm just not... I, you, I, with something like that, I feel like something really bad has to happen, but I'm, and I'm waiting for it, and I'm not seeing it. So, you know, we're definitely going to have to get to that in predictions, but it looks like that may be coming, but I do agree I have not seen it yet. And uh, before we get into some juicy news and gossip as we've had a week off here with the holidays. Um, can I just give a quick shout out to Bruce, who I really wish would have been in the episode a little bit more. He was in there for like uh, one second. And uh, I, how much do you love Bruce? I mean, I wish we could have seen more of him. I mean, I always love Bruce. I was also just recently watching the rerun of Kendall's Sweet 16, and he's such a funny guy. Um, so I like that he got he got to drop in. And I like how he is with Mason because, I mean, he is his grandfather, but he's not his biological grandfather. But, he, you know, I, he's, a, he's such a great guy. Yeah, so shout out, shout out to Bruce Jenner. We wish we could have had more, on you, more of you on this episode, but we appreciated the cameo nonetheless. And uh, we definitely have tons of news and gossip and predictions. I want to talk more about that conversation as to, you know, the end of Kim and Chris coming up, it looks like. So let's take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. After Buzz TV. Hi. I was once like you, a lazy, angry loner whose only joy was watching TV and surfing the net. And like you, after I'd see one of my favorite TV shows, I'd be so excited and have so many questions that I'd actually have to talk to my douchebag coworkers about it at the water cooler. Then I discovered AfterBuzzTV.com. AfterBuzz TV produces after-show webcasts and podcasts for TV series of all kinds, like post-game wrap-up shows for all your favorite TV shows. AfterBuzz TV hosts are industry insiders who break down episodes of shows, take calls from fans, and interview cast and crew from each series with over 60 different after shows, from Boardwalk Empire to American Idol to Vampire Diaries to Real Housewives and more. Now, after a night of TV, I can ignore my stupid co-workers, who I hate, and go straight to my desk and watch or listen to all my favorite AfterBuzz TV after shows and have all the TV fan interaction I need. Thank you, AfterBuzz TV. AfterBuzz TV. What do you want to buzz about? AfterBuzz TV News. Okay, so Mari, we were just talking about this. Chris Humphreys got booed big time during his first game back with the Nets uh, during the game against the New York Knicks, Knicks at Madison Square Garden recently. Kim Kardashian's ex endured quite the uproar, constantly getting booed once he entered the game in the second quarter. And judging from the commentators' remarks, it was hard to miss on court. Uh, they commented, Chris Humphreys coming into the game, just signing a new deal. There's, uh, it was like they were talking, and then they couldn't help but comment. The booze from the fans, they said. He's one of the most famous players in the NBA now, and it has nothing to do with basketball, but obviously with his marriage and quick divorce of Kim Kardashian. You feel bad for the young man. He's going to no doubt hear all sorts of taunts and stuff throughout the season. I mean, if you guys watch this, you can definitely catch it on the web. It was really, it was so distracting. I can't imagine how he could have totally shut that out. I mean, how would, how do you think he was feeling? And I'm sure you caught it, Mari. Um, it was really, really bad. I was surprised. I was surprised at how bad it was. But you know what? I'm happy that since that game, he has been doing well and that in the games he's played, he's been scoring a lot of shots and doing well because that's the best way to, you know, shut them up. You know what I mean? And I think he's a dick. I think he's a prick and a douchebag, but even <laughs> I don't think he deserves that because I think for the most part, most of those words I just used to describe him were because he's young and he's immature. And I don't think he knew what he was getting himself into when all of this happened. And he could have never predicted what happened, what went down, and being booed like that. And so, you know, I kind of feel bad for the guy because, you know, it's like either 
it, he gets the, the worst from both ends. Either people are booing him because they just hate the Kardashian franchise in general, and he was a part of it, or they're booing him because they love the Kardashian franchise and they hate him because of it. So, like, he's in a lose-lose situation, and I can't help but feel bad for the guy and just hope that he continues to play well because that's the only way to shut up his critics. Right. This is definitely, I mean, you're an athlete, a superstar athlete in the middle of the public eye. I mean, athletes have had to deal with this. This will definitely show what he's made of. I think it's a humbling thing for him. I do feel bad for him, but I think this will be a great test as to what he's really made of as an athlete. And, you know, guys his age go through stuff like this, and maybe this till you know, whatever. I'm not sure I think quite as strongly about him as you, Mari, (laughs) with that lovely list of descriptive words. But um, I certainly do agree I feel bad for the guy, and I think he might learn a lesson from all this. I don't know if Kim will learn a lesson from all this, because I think she kind of just gets to get away with not wanting to be married anymore. Okay, she's not married anymore. I I wonder if Kim will learn as much from this as Chris will. Um, And I don't know what he was like before Kardashian land, but I think this might end up being a good thing for him. It might teach him a couple of lessons in life, you know? I mean, I'm around. I actually age, think that's a very, yeah, I think that's a very astute observation that he will learn a lot from this experience, and she will learn very little and will continue on in her world uh, because everyone keeps buying her magazines. Like, you know, of the five celebrity magazines this week, the Kardashians were on the cover of three, and so it's like she can get away with these things, and people still love her. The public will still follow her. And she doesn't put herself in a forum like a basketball game like that where the whole audience is going to boo her. So she'll never really learn and kind of stay in this kind of sheltered environment, whereas I think he really will learn. Exactly. And, you know, we have a few other stories to kind of coincide with that line of thinking. And uh, I don't know why I'm, I'm talking about Chris like as if I'm not around his age, but I do think... He will learn from it. I think that's the good thing, and uh, I hope it does make him a better basketball player at the end of the day. <laughs> but um, and he and listen, the public will get over this. I mean, Kim will continue to be in her spotlight the way she is. But for him, I think over time, as you said, just play well, shut up the critics, and move forward. Um, but another scandal, of course, the word associated with the Kardashians is uh, is has. Uh, sort of um, um, embroiled her in this uh, sweatshop scandal uh, after a well-known human rights organization said it was conducting an investigation into whether the family's merchandise is being manufactured under questionable working conditions in China. The Kardashian family had to launch its own investigation, and their verdict is that the story is not true, uh, according to the rep of the Kardashians. The family was tipped off on the explosive allegations that were made after the dubious tandem of Star Magazine and Radar claimed that certain items from K-Dash by Kardashian, Kris Jenner Collection, and Shoe Dazzle were made under horrific conditions. The publications alleged factories employees often work up to 84 hours a week in non-air conditioned facilities and only earn a dollar an hour and that prompted a probe by the Watchdog Group Institute for Global Labor and Human Rights. So the family is taking it very seriously and after checking things out, determined that the report was wrong, but certainly not what Kim Kardashian needs right now after everything else that's going on in her life. Uh, This is never a good story to pop up, but, you know, that's what happens when you license your name out to all of these kinds of things. Um, If this anything was happening, which they're saying it wasn't, I'm not sure that Kim Kardashian was sitting around knowing this and not really doing anything about it, you know, so you always have to feel a little bit bad when something like this comes up because you would never, the Kardashians would never know this was going on if it was, which apparently they're saying it's not. Uh, What do you think of this, Mari? I actually wrote about this exact topic on my legal news site. Uh, So if anyone is interested, it's thelegallady.com. And uh, basically, I wrote about that Star Magazine is now right in the line of Kris Jenner's Warpath because the problem with their article 
is the guy they interviewed from this, uh, you know, what is it called, Institute for Global Labor and Human Rights, who made all these claims about these sweatshop scandal, about these sweatshop conditions, was talking about sweatshops in that region in general, but had not actually visited these sweatshops that the Kardashians' clothing and products were made in. So this whole interview and this whole headline, Kardashian sweatshop scandal, he, he even admitted in an interview, he said, we just started our investigation. We haven't even gone to the sweatshops and looked at the conditions. He was just making a generalization based off of all the other sweatshops in the region that most likely it fits within a line of, you know, girls 16 years old working these long days with, little pay and little food and everything. But I I think that Chris Jenner and the Kardashians have a fair like defamation claim against Star Magazine here because this is really gonna hurt their business and they published this article based off of what could be false information and I think they just kinda of jumped on the story a little too soon. But then afterwards what I thought was so interesting was the head of the Institute for Global Labor and Human Rights once this interview, he came up with this interview that made him look really bad. Like, basically, he he said these claims about the Kardashians, but hadn't actually done the research. He then, um, and I put a link to this on my Twitter. I can tweet it out again. He then sent out a press release where he basically went on this long rampage about how terrible sweatshops are and how Kim Kardashian should lead the charge in, like, in not doing this anymore, and why are the Kardashians not making the information about the addresses and names of these sweatshops public? I guess it's been difficult for them to research where they are because they don't make the addresses and names of the locations public, and was kind of like um, pointing at her for that. Um, but it was a very strong worded um, uh, statement basically to cover his own ass. So it'll be interesting to see where this went and ends up, you know, is he, is he going to be the bad guy? Is Star Magazine going to be the bad guy? Or in the end, are the Kardashians going to be the bad guy? So I'll definitely be following it. Um, and I guess we'll, we'll, we'll keep posted on this. Absolutely, guys. You have to check out thelegallady.com. I have to get caught up after the holidays here. And uh, I definitely go to you for these kinds of stories. So uh, that's with one L. Everybody be sure to check that out. And, of course, we'll keep you updated week to week here. That is definitely, um, I think this is not the last of this story. It's, it's definitely going to continue. So never a good thing. You know, my family, I come from a business family. Things like this can get very, very serious. So, um, you know, very interesting to see how this will play out. Um, but speaking of Kim Kardashian always being in the tabloids, um, it would become no surprise that she's the top spot in the 2011 Heat Index, uh, the reality TV regular ranked number one on USA Today's poll, which measures exposure in celebrity news magazines and on websites, because obviously they relentlessly chronicled her engagement, marriage, and divorce. These two-part special, which we covered, Kim's fairytale wedding, a Kardashian event, drew more than 8 million viewers, so no surprise there that she nabbed that number one spot. I can't remember the last time I, I opened a magazine and she wasn't the cover of it. <laughs> so uh, no surprise on that one. And uh, let's get into a little style here, as I always love to talk about, Mari. Did you happen to ask, <laughs> and I do have the picture of it, uh, for the new year, Kim's new hairdo, which she uh, rang in 2012 with in uh, fresh Full blunt bangs, which we now actually today, after spotting her at dinner with her family at a Mexican restaurant, she doesn't have them anymore. There's something called clip-on bangs, so we're trying to figure out if they were actually real bangs or not, but she did reveal the bang look um, with a white-hot Gucci mini and a keyhole cutout at the neckline uh, for Cow's nightclub in Las Vegas, where she paired her waist length locks with Lauren Jules and metallic peep toe pumps. So uh, definitely check out this look right here. Um, 31 year old reality star also told us weekly that she's excited about moving forward and not looking back. I kind of think, you know, when you're ready for a new year, people do all these new things. 
Um, she said she learned a good lesson about herself, and it's to always follow your heart, and I think I'll never stop doing that, she said. I'm looking forward to just having a really good 2012 and soaking in all the lessons learned in 2011. That's it. Simple. So I don't know. How do you feel about her, her do, if those bangs are in fact real? I knew they were fake because but I just knew that it wasn't going to be a permanent thing. I mean, most of these, most celebrity stews are extensions or pinning their hair up or like, you know, put, put pinning it under to make it look shorter. I mean, nowadays I think that they rarely go through like that drastic of a change, like realistically. So I knew it was probably fake, but it's kind of fun to have for, for New Year's, you know, just to change up her look a little bit. I thought it was cute. And in terms of what she said, I'm not surprised because she's kind of trying to, like, cover her own image. Um, I thought it was interesting because didn't she also in that same interview admit that she's been living at her mom's house ever since the divorce, basically, and that she said something that she's loved, like, walking around in sweatpants and not wearing makeup every day. I don't know how appropriate it is for a 31-year-old to be moving back in with your mom. I mean, I know she went through this big divorce scandal and had to keep a low-key profile, and maybe she didn't want to be home because of the paparazzi, but it's not like the paparazzi aren't at her mom's house either. I don't know how appropriate that is, but the whole family is kind of, like, weirdly inappropriate when it comes to that, like, Rob living with Chloe and Lamar, and then I heard something about Rob even maybe moving to their home in Dallas, too. Like, I don't know. Like, when you're adults, you don't live together like that. (laughs) I know what you're saying. I kind of... Have to say, though, I have a family that's kind of all, like, close like that. And I, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's better than them all hating each other. But I certainly, you know, it gets to a point where you're kind of wondering, like, the Rob thing. And, you know, if she stays with her mom for a couple weeks, you know, for company, whatever. But, you know, she certainly has plenty of her own money to kind of do whatever she wants to do at this point. Um, So I think it's interesting that here she is. You know, we said we're wondering if she's going to learn her lesson. Here she is saying she's learning the lesson. She's simplifying her life. She even simplified her Twitter page to a plain background. She tweeted that, you know, she's <laughs> all about simplicity. But then this story just popped up for me uh, leading into the show. I actually, you know, being out on the ski slopes, I don't know exactly when this story popped up, but I just picked up this extra story, which does this go hand in hand with simplifying your life that she's uh, rumored to want to want to adopt a Haitian baby now? Uh, it has been reported that Kim Kardashian is seriously considering looking into the possibility of adopting a Haitian baby, so they say, in an attempt to revive her flailing image, uh, some, some insiders said. Kim claims that after seeing firsthand the awful living conditions that some of these Haitian babies are living in, she's simply had to find out how she could help and was eager to adopt one of them. An insider said that she wants to adopt a Haitian baby and she wants to do it as soon as possible. She's telling friends she wants to adopt because of the awful living conditions she saw, but it's pretty obvious, says the insider, she's only doing it to revive her image. And the same insider, who apparently isn't too friendly with her to be saying all this, says she just uses children and her family to make her look good on camera. Adding, Kim treats Mason like an accessory, not a baby. She plays with him when she's posing for pictures, but otherwise she's always busy texting to have anything to do with him. She's even said that she's too into her career to have a baby. So what do you make of this story and the so-called simplicity that is Kim Kardashian? (laughs) I never buy when these anonymous sources make these, like, outlandish statements, like, she's not an, into her nephew, she's just texting. I mean, I see it. It's, it's her nephew. Of course she loves a nephew. I highly doubt she's actually adopting a Haitian baby, though it's Kim Kardashian, so I wouldn't put it past her, but I sincerely, sincerely hope that that is not true, and I highly doubt it's true, um, but I, if she's... I, I think that would be a very, very dumb move, and if she really were going to adopt a kid like that, I think that would be the final straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of, like, the public lashing out at her. So she just needs to continue to stay low-key for a while, I think, let her other sisters get 
more publicity. I mean, Chloe and Lamar, their show is going to be starting in February. I think she just needs to keep a low key profile for a while because the second she starts dating someone again or whatever, it's going to be huge news and she has to be careful to not have the public lash out at her. I couldn't agree more. Kim, I like the story prior to this better. Stick with the simple thing. Stay low key. Stay in your mom's house if you have to. Don't wear makeup. Wear your sweatpants for a while. And uh, I think I agree. That is definitely the best advice. But uh, we have a lot more of Courtney and Kim take New York to get through to get to the point that the public is at right now. And uh, let's get into some predictions about next week. And now, your After Buzz TV predictions. Okay, so the end is near, according to next week's preview, which is a double dose, uh, two episodes, and I'm not sure. How do you feel about them promoting to it the way they did, Mari, where they're like, you better stay tuned because this is where the end begins, or, you know, however they said it. I mean, these are people's lives. These are people's relationships. Um, You know, here's Chris getting booed at these sports games. I don't know how I feel about the way they promoted to it, but I am as a viewer, and I know you said this as well, I am waiting for that big blow to come. So it seems like we might be getting a dose of that next week in the back-to-back episodes. Um, I I just want to see what happens, because like we talked about earlier, I haven't seen anything that's really been a bombshell, like, oh my God, this marriage is doomed. It's just been fight after fight, but nothing I didn't think they couldn't overcome. So I'm curious to see what it is. It sounded like he left somewhere overseas and didn't even tell her. Um, But yeah, I'm not surprised by E kind of exploiting this whole divorce thing. We all want to know what happens. It's not appropriate, but E isn't the only channel that does this. Because we're right after this, we'll be talking about Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, and they're also talking about a divorce and promoting the same type of thing. So, you know, I don't put it past reality show producers to do things like that anymore. And, um, you know, we all want to know what happened with this divorce. We all want to know what happened in those 72 days that led her to to quit the marriage. Because thus far, however many days into the marriage we're at, it, it doesn't seem like a red flag to me. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely, I, I agree. I don't think, I don't blame E. I don't really, you know, well, I think the Bravo situation, which if you guys want to stick around and join us for Real Housewives is a different story. I don't blame E for kind of promoting it this way necessarily because they're the ones who kind of brought all this on themselves. Um, so, of course, as viewers, we, we do want to know what happens. I just think it was a little dramatic, but I guess something dramatic does have to happen. I think we're all waiting for it. But the weirdest thing is we see Scott um, in this preview going crazy. Like, he's going to get into major trouble more than we even see Chris getting into trouble. So uh, what do you think of our boy Scott, who we love, uh, at this point, do you think he's really going to get into some trouble as well? Um, I, the whole drinking thing, we'll see, because every time the show is like, dr- Scott's drinking again, and they have that teaser, it ends up being nothing. Like, there have been multiple, multiple episodes where I thought, oh, no, he's drinking again, and then it turns out to be nothing. But there was one scene where he's like, I'm going to pee on this. So it was something ridiculous like that. So I don't know. We'll have to see. But either way, uh, once again, Scott seems like he's going to be the most hilarious part of the episode. Right. Even if he's getting himself into trouble, he's going to make us laugh. And that's what I love about him. So I'm certainly looking forward to it looks like a double dose double the talk here on After Buzz TV so you definitely have to check us out next week uh, on our usual time right after the show and in the meantime tweet me at Jackie Moran, tweet us at After Buzz TV at Mari Fagel and Legal Lady Tweets and follow TheLegalLady.com for news and gossip and until next week enjoy and we'll hopefully see you for Real Housewives following the show 
from producers Kevin Undergaro and Phil Svitek, engineer DJ Jesse Janity, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. If you have questions or comments, be sure to buzz us at info at AfterBuzzTV.com. And you can find us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter by searching for AfterBuzz TV. Buzz you later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.